All right. Uh, welcome to the call, everybody. Um, people are still logging in. We're starting a few minutes early. Uh, we got Nate here on from Quest IRA. Having a little bit of technical difficulty, so Nate's going to take over while I play around with some stuff. So, Nate, uh, do a little intro of yourself, in case people don't know who you are, and take over. No problem. Hope, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Nate Hare. I'm the vice president of Quest IRA. We're a self-directed IRA provider based in Houston, Texas. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we have uh, clients all over the nation. And what we do is we provide self-directed IRA services for people who want to use their IRAs or old 401ks or whatever retirement bucket they have. Uh, use that to invest in things like real estate, promissory notes, or what we call alternative assets, things outside of the public market. So most people don't realize you can even do this. Most people just think you can invest your IRA into stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CDs, all that stuff. Uh, most, a lot of people don't realize you can use your IRA to invest in things like real estate. And I'm gonna just talk about why that might be important for you as an investor, whether you're a real estate investor or any type of investor. I think it's important to understand all of your investment options and talk about the benefits of a self-directed IRA and what that really is. But then what I'm really on here tonight to do is to drill in these seven types of accounts that can be self-directed. Because most people might have one or two retirement accounts set up for themselves that give them benefit for their own retirement. But there's seven accounts here at Quest that can be self-directed and they all have different tax benefits to them. Some tax benefits actually can be beneficial to you today before retirement. And all of them can be invested into real estate or any other types of investments that you choose. So I'm really gonna talk about those seven types of accounts because if you can understand those seven types of accounts and understand how to use them uh, in combination with some of your investments as an investor, you will save yourself in that rat race of trying to keep up with the taxes you pay each year to get to retirement. So it's really just about teaching people how to keep more of their profit by paying less in taxes using these seven magical accounts we have here at Quest uh, to do some of your real estate or your note investing. So, and I think we'll have some questions along the way and I'll be around to answer some questions. First, I have to have a disclaimer that as a self-directed IRA administrator, we don't give tax, legal, or investment advice. I actually came from a real estate background. I uh, worked for a lot of large banks uh, as a lender, uh, both with big banks and small banks. So I have a lot of investment experience and so do our other principles of our company. Our uh, President Quincy is actually a real estate attorney, not practicing, but uh, he's the smartest guy I've ever met. Uh, he's a real estate investor himself. He's also, he was a fee attorney for American Title Company. He got bored and bought a couple H&R Blocks at one point. I mean, the guy's just got a lot of knowledge in his head. And even he can't give tax legal or investment advice because as a self-directed IRA provider, we have to stay investment neutral, but we let our clients pick their own investments. So with that, there's more responsibility, so we always encourage people to consult with their professionals, uh, CPAs, tax advisors, uh, or other financial professionals before entering into any type of investment. I'm just offering some education. And what we're talking about is just a self-directed IRA. I'm pretty sure most people on this call understand what a self-directed IRA is, but just in case we have some newbies out there, I always have to remind people that a self-directed IRA is not a type of IRA at all. There's actually no such thing as legally as a self-directed IRA. Self-directed is just a marketing term. IRAs are the same no matter where you go. If you have an IRA at Fidelity or Charles Schwab, that IRA follows the same set of rules as an IRA at Quest. So why is it different? Why are you only limited to stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and those traditional assets when you have an IRA there? But then when you have an IRA at Quest, you can buy all these other things. It has nothing to do with the IRA rules at all. It has to do with the companies. Most people just have their investments with, or their IRAs with those traditional custodians. And again, they're in the business to sell investments. So they're only gonna offer you things in your retirement account that make them money. Stocks are, are one of them. At Quest, we don't sell investments, so that's not how we make our money. We're just a fee-based service. But when we're not selling investments, our account agreement with our client says, your IRA can hold anything the IRS allows here at Quest, but you pick the investment. And truthfully, the IRS does not tell us what we're allowed to invest in. They only tell us what we're not allowed to invest in. And it's just two things, life insurance contracts and collectibles. Those are the only two investment restrictions for an IRA. So literally anything you can hold title to, 
can be owned in the name of your retirement account. You just have to find a company that's willing to administrate your IRA and understands those investments. So what we do is we administrate IRAs for the purpose of buying mainly real estate investments because we understand real estate and I, say, I would say that's our niche, uh, but you can invest in all sorts of weird stuff. And I'll get to that when I talk about the investment options. But an IRA is an IRA is an IRA. Most of our clients have an IRA at Fidelity. They also have an IRA at Quest. And that allows them to invest in paper assets and uh, alternative assets. And that's what gets me to this point, which is the benefits of a self-directed IRA. Why would you even want a self-directed IRA at Quest? Well, one reason is just diversification. I would argue that diversification is not having some high risk mutual funds, some medium risk mutual funds and some low risk mutual funds. I would say you just have a bunch of mutual funds and mutual funds are just paper assets, a bunch of stocks. A lot of those stocks, most of those stocks are not going to have collateral, I'm not calling those investments bad, but when you invest heavily in those types of assets, you're at liberty of whether the market's going up or down, whether you understand it or not. Uh, we see a lot of people 2008, 2009, people's 401ks turned into 201ks, right? Because we hit a big dive and the market took a dive. And with that, companies went out of business. And if your retirement was invested in those assets, you don't have any collateral. You don't get anything back when companies go out of business and that's your retirement savings. It's different when you look at things that we hold here at Quest. I like to give the example of real estate and even notes secured by real estate because I'm actually a note investor. But I'll just use real estate as an example. Real estate's a tangible asset. So whether you're a real estate investor or not, I think it is important to understand that you can hold tangible assets in your retirement, not just a bunch of stocks that are not tangible. A piece of real estate is tangible. It, it could go up and down and appreciate and depreciate, sure. But if you look at real estate today and go back 15 years in time, it's always going to be worth more today than it was 15 years ago, 99.9% .9 of the time. So real estate does go up and it has the trend to go up, but it's always going to be there. It doesn't evaporate. Plus real estate has multiple streams of income, which I like. So if you hold real estate in a retirement account, A, it's tangible, but you also have multiple streams of income, whether you're holding it as a rental and then selling it for appreciation or doing all sorts of things, uh, you do get some benefits there. So again, a self-directed IRA will allow you to diversify and hold some of those tangible assets in combination with maybe some of your stocks at Fidelity. Um, the main point about this whole IRA conversation though is just tax savings. Everybody is looking for a way to save in giving too much money back to Uncle Sam. And I see this a lot with a lot of beginning investors um, who don't take advantage of the, uh, the free education that we provide on these self-directed IRAs. They go out there and they try to take their money or borrow money from a bank or whatever, and they try to go buy investments, buy real estate, buy notes, and they make good money for themselves, but they find that they're in this rat race. They're just not getting uh, enough deals to get to retirement or to get more money in their pocket because really what's happening is taxes are eating them up on a, on a yearly basis. You make $100,000 investing with your money, you're only gonna get $60,000 of that and you're left with less capital to reinvest for the next year. So you got this rat race that you're trying to keep up with the taxes you pay. And that's just what happens because we're individuals and individuals are taxpayers. An IRA is treated different. An IRA, by definition, is a tax-exempt trust. You're just the fiduciary of the trust, meaning your job to your IRA is to pick good investments for that IRA trust. And in uh, exchange, the government says, we'll allow those investments to grow completely tax-deferred, meaning you can buy and sell a house, no taxes. Buy and sell another house, no taxes. You don't take, pay taxes typically until you take a distribution, and that might be 30, 40 years down the road, who knows, when you're retired. So in theory, yes, you can grow a bucket of money faster by not paying taxes annually. If you defer all the taxes to the future, your bucket grows bigger faster. But I'm gonna talk about uh, several different IRAs that not only grow tax deferred, but when you take distributions, the distributions will be tax-free and penalty-free forever. So that means eliminating taxes from your life. And I think that is a very cool thing. Maybe I'm just a nerd, but I think everybody should understand how to make investments or do investments and pay zero taxes. I think it's, it, it is, there's no better knowledge on earth. And unfortunately, they don't teach this to us in school. So I went to school. They never taught us about these types of, of things. So I'm going to talk about different types of accounts that you can use 
to invest with that you will eliminate taxes from your life altogether. And you will pass on more money to your heirs if that's something that interests you too. But ultimately, if you're going to be an investor, obviously, I think that the biggest thing a self-directed IRA provides you is just the ability to invest in what you know best. I personally don't understand the stock market, never have, and I don't have any interest to. But I love real estate, and I love the lending side of real estate. That's what I understand. So doesn't it make sense that I invest my IRA into those same types of investments? Because I understand them. Sure, I'll stub my toe here or there. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to stub my toe less investing in the things that I'm knowledgeable about. And the self-directed IRA allows you to invest in things you're knowledgeable about, whether it's real estate or something else. We actually have a client. We always say this, but it's, it's a true story. We have a client that uses his IRA to buy and sell horse sperm. Maybe it's because we're based in Texas. I have no idea. But the argument this is, is a that, real story. What's that? <laughs> I said, this is a real story? This is a real story. The guy uses his IRA to buy and sell horse sperm. And the funny thing is, he always wants to tell us about it, and, and, and he gets so excited about it. And I'm sure there's money to be made doing that, but I don't, I'm not touching that investment, literally or figuratively, because I don't understand it, right? So, But that doesn't mean he doesn't understand it. We have another client that does, uh, you know, I can't name names, but did pretty well for himself this year investing into oil and gas interests. That's just his knowledge base. Made $2 million investing in oil and gas leases. Wow. So again, since the IRS doesn't limit us on what we can invest in, I think it just makes sense that you take your retirement and invest in what you're knowledgeable about, whether it's real estate or horse sperm or, or whatever. So again, <laughs> it, it, we always say invest in what you know best and you'll make better returns in the long in the long run. So these are, this is the, uh, the part of the presentation I really wanted to get across to everybody, is the types of plans that can be self-directed. And when I go through these, just think about these as diff this is different pages on the menu. The first page of the menu, I'm gonna just talk about the personal plans that can be self-directed. And when you think about these, think about them as, as if, how many of these accounts can I have? How many can I qualify for? Because the more I have, the more tax benefits I get. And if I can have an IRA from each page of the menu, I'm maximizing my tax savings. And really what you're doing is you're just taking some of the money that you have and not investing it in your name because you'll get taxed on that profit, but putting it into some type of, type of tax sheltered plan like these where you won't have to pay taxes on the profit. And some people say, well, how, you know, how much should I allocate to my IRAs versus my personal? Well, I think that question is just a personal question for you. I like one of our clients, he kind of oversimplifies it, but he, he puts it in a pretty good way. He says, as an investor, I just want to do enough deals to make this much money. And what that much money is, is that's where his needs are met. That's his line, right? That's his whatever, how you ever want to calculate it. He does it on a monthly basis. He says, I need this much money, you know, to pay for the cars, to pay for my wife's, you know, purses, to, you know, put by the kids uh, Christmas gifts at Christmas. You know, the, we call that your eats bucket, right? Your necessities. What does it take to, for you to get by? He says, I want to do enough investments as an investor to I hit that line. But once I've hit that line, I don't want to keep doing investments in my name or my LLC's name because all that's going to do is means I'm working for the government. 30, 40, 50% of my profit above that line is going right back to Uncle Sam. So I just want to make sure where my line is and I want to do investments to hit that line. Anything above that, I'm putting those deals in my IRAs because I don't want to pay taxes on those investments. Okay. Now, there, you can do it uh, another way too. It can really, some investments are better suited in an IRA. Uh, a lot of times time, it might be a, um, a decision maker based on your investment. For instance, if it's an investment that is a, where you make profit right away, right? Wholesaling, some, uh, you know, uh, real estate options, those types of things. Those are investments that you might make money right away. Those might be better done in your personal name because again, that puts money on the, on, on the table, that puts food on the table, that puts money in your back pocket. But if you're doing an investment that maybe the, the return doesn't, you don't realize it for later down the road, for instance, if you're a buying property subject to, I don't know here if a lot of you, your people are buying property subject to, but that's been a growing uh, investment uh, that I've seen here at Quest. I don't know, it's just people are getting more familiar with it. Um, but you know, that's an investment that's really intriguing because what an investor is doing is putting a very small amount of money up, taking over the underlying mortgage on the house and paying it off going forward. But those investment strategies are, are going to pay off 
20 or 20 years down the road. So that's a perfect investment to throw in an IRA because a lot of times you don't get the tax benefits that to maximize until later down the road too. Mm -hmm. So again, sometimes the investment itself will dictate, is it better to do it in my name or is it better to just put it in the shelf and, and put it in my IRA? So, um, but these are your personal plans that can be self-directed. And these are the ones that are most, that most people are familiar with traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs. Traditional IRAs are the ones most people have because you usually get those traditional IRAs if you ever had a 401k or a 403b or some employer sponsored plan uh, that you had at work, you might have been putting money into that plan, getting a tax deduction, your employer might have been matching if they're nice and they were getting a tax deduction. So that account, we call it a pre-tax account, it's just money you haven't paid taxes on yet. The benefit is, is it grows tax deferred, meaning you don't have to pay taxes on the profit until you take a distribution. But you want to think about this. If you have a traditional IRA, does it make sense to prolong the taxes to the future? Because if you start with a bucket this big, or you start with say hundred grand, and you could turn that, you think in 20 years into a million dollars. If you do that within a traditional IRA, you'll pay taxes on a million dollars. You just don't see it because you don't see it until you start taking distributions. And typically those distributions are after you've passed 59 and a half and you don't have to pay the early withdrawal penalty. But remember, with a traditional IRA, you're always going to pay taxes when you take distributions, right? Regardless of how big the bucket is. It's important to realize that because when you, when you look up self-directed IRAs, you always hear people talking about the Roth. And I think rightfully so. O almost so much that people think the Roth IRA is the only one that can be self-directed. That's not true. The Roth IRA just, for a lot of people, is the best account to be self-directed, depending on how successful of an investor you are. Because how a Roth IRA works, it works the complete opposite. When you put money into a Roth IRA, you don't get a tax deduction. So there's no immediate benefit. You don't get to write it off on your taxes. However, the trade-off I think is, is, more, is more beneficial. The trade-off is since it's an after-tax contribution, you already paid your taxes on that money. Just think about money in your back pocket, you put it in, you don't get a deduction, you paid your taxes on that money already. As you grow that Roth IRA, once you've had that Roth IRA open for five tax years, and you're above the age of 59 and a half, all of your distributions from the Roth IRA are tax-free and penalty-free forever. So that means you could take money out of your Roth IRA forever, tax-free and penalty-free till the day you die. And even better, when you die and you pass it to your heirs, they take distributions out of that inherited Roth IRA, tax-free and penalty-free forever. So I'll give you an actual real story that I really like that that shows you how powerful this Roth IRA can be. And just to let everybody know, there is an opportunity for anybody nowadays to have a Roth IRA. They actually try to limit people from having a Roth IRA. If you make a healthy six-figure income, they don't even let you make contributions to a Roth IRA. Before 2010, they had another rule that said if you made $100,000 or more, you couldn't do what's called a conversion, pay taxes on some of your traditional IRA to convert it to your Roth. So if you made a six-figure income 2010 and before, it was almost impossible to have a Roth IRA. Well, in 2010, they removed the income limit, that $100,000 income limit, off conversions. Okay? The income limits for making contributions to Roth IRA still exist, but there's no income limit for conversions. So anybody, regardless of your income, if you have a traditional IRA, you can pay taxes on some or all of it to convert it to a Roth. And all you do is you treat it as income to yourself. If you want to convert $50,000, it's treated as a distribution to you, but it's rolled into a Roth IRA. They, the taxes have been paid and can grow tax-free and penalty-free forever. The analysis you want to make as an investor is if you have a traditional IRA is when, when's a better time to pay taxes? Should I pay them now or should I pay them later? I say, if you're going to grow it to a sizable amount, if you're going to grow it much bigger, pay them now and get the taxes out of the way. Or if you're looking to pass more wealth onto your heirs, that might be a decision maker too. And this is the story I kind of wanted to tell is that we had a, we had a client, he passed away about four years ago, unfortunately. However, uh, this story I, I like to tell because it, it really rings true on how powerful this conversion opportunity can be, not only for yourself, but for your heirs. So this client had uh, worked at the University of Texas for 43 years. He had a pretty sizable retirement account that he had built up with the school. So when he retired, he had rolled this pre-taxed account into a traditional IRA, okay? And he liked real estate. He 
accumulated 12 rental properties and they were all pretty good rental properties. And in a traditional IRA, they were generating rents and it was pretty good investments, all in good areas. Again, the, all the homes were owned in his traditional IRA. But he was getting to a point in his life where he knew he was not gonna be around much longer. He was in his 80s at this time. And he was looking at what's gonna happen when I pass this traditional IRA onto my uh, next generation. Because it was about a $2 million traditional IRA, good houses, all generating rents. He said, if I die and pass this to my heirs, who's going to pay the taxes now? They're going to pay the taxes. And also what happens is the, the next generation has to take distributions of those assets as well. So if you pass them traditional IRA money, not only are they going to pay tax, but sometimes they're going to have to sell off those assets, even if they're good assets. So he did two things to change that story for the, his next generation. One, he said, right when 2010, when they removed that income limit, he said, I'm going to convert the entire thing. So he said, he said, Quest, send me the 1099. I'll take care of it. The IRS can come chase me for it. Okay, so we got literally a $2 million 1099. But again, all of those properties were now revested into the name of his Roth IRA that can grow tax-free forever. But he did one other thing that I really like is he changed the beneficiary on his Roth IRA because initially he had his children as his beneficiaries. But if he's 80, how old do you think his children are? Mm -hmm. They're in their 50s and 60s. And how the distributions work on an inherited IRA, when if you inherit one from somebody that passes, you have to take distributions each year of that account and they calculate it off the end of the year balance and your life expectancy. So if you're curious about when we die, just go to irs.gov. They have a chart <laughs> that just tells you, you die right here. So, uh, but if, if you pass a $2 million bucket of money, to a 60 year old with a short life expectancy, how big do you think the distributions are? They're pretty sizable and they have to take them or they're penalized. So even if the investments are good investments, what's that force them to do? They gotta just start selling houses just to account for the required distribution they have to take each year. So what he did is not only did he convert the entire thing to a Roth IRA, but he had the beneficiary of the Roth IRA, not his kids, but he made it the youngest person in his family, which was his great, great granddaughter that had just been born, who was four months old, not 60 years old. So now what that happens is when you base it off the life expectancy of a four month old, now the distributions are minuscule, which allows those properties to sit in that inherited Roth IRA for say 80, 90 years, generating rents that can be distributed to those beneficiaries tax-free and penalty-free forever. So how much do you think you can make from here $2 million if you could invest it tax-free for 80 years. Oh, man. Well, that's, that's what's so important with, with plan, like planning from the beginning. Like, right, you have all these different type of IRAs. You have to plan with the end, with the end in mind. And that's what this gentleman did that you were, that you were working with is he planned ahead. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you got to plan, look, where, what do I want? And then backtrack from there and plan it mm -hmm. backwards. And that's exactly what he did. So that's why you hear a lot of people talk about this Roth IRA. It is amazing. And just think about it for yourself too. If you accumulate, you know, 10 notes, even I like notes. I might have 10 notes in my Roth IRA, but once I have 10 notes in my Roth IRA and I'm 59 and a half and I've had it for five years, well, guess what? Every time uh, uh, one of those borrowers makes an interest payment, I can just take it out of my Roth IRA tax-free and penalty-free forever. At that point, I would never do an investment in my name again because I pay taxes on my investments. If my Roth pays no taxes on its investments, I'm doing everything in my Roth IRA and I'll just live tax-free off the distributions forever. And the IRS will hate that, but they can't do anything about it because it's their rules. So we like to stick it to the government with their own rules. And one of the ways to do it is with that Roth IRA. So uh, we have classes on this too. I'm just kind of like touching on, on the most important parts. Uh, but Roth IRAs, I think everybody should have a Roth IRA. Everybody should set one up. Um, and even, especially if you have a traditional IRA, you wanna make that analysis. Should I pay taxes on some of this money and start converting it over to a Roth? Because they might put that income limit back on. You never know. They, they actually toyed with that idea this year, but it won't be around forever. So if you don't have a Roth IRA, hurry up and get one, I would say. You can call us and we'll set one up for you. Um, so those are your personal plans. Again, both of those can be self-directed. Even though I like the Roth, the traditional can be self-directed as well. Um, and they can all invest into all different types of assets, real estate, notes, and all sorts of stuff. I kind of talked about that. Roth distributions, qualified distributions from a Roth are tax-free forever. There's also no required minimum distributions on a Roth IRA. 
Uh, that's something most people don't uh, realize. On a traditional IRA, since it's pre-tax and you haven't paid your taxes yet, once you hit 70 and a half, age 70 and a half, they actually stop you from making contributions, even if you're still working, and they force you to start distributing some of the money. Because again, you owe, uh, Mr. you owe Uncle Sam a piece of that. So they force you to take distributions so that they can tax you on that. With a Roth IRA, once you hit 70 and a half, assumingly your distributions are tax free. So they don't force you to liquidate the account. So again, preservation of wealth is easier in a Roth IRA because the government doesn't force you to distribute it. And again, you have a longer period of time uh, to grow it tax free uh, forever. If you're self-employed, this is the other page on the menu. So if you have some self-employment income, think about this, you have these additional accounts that can be self-directed. You can still have the personal plans, traditional Roth, but if you wanna shelter more money away from Uncle Sam, you can do it based on having some self-employment income. These are the three that we have at Quest and the three most popular, you'll find it at any custodian really, even Fidelity. Um, and those would be the SEP IRA, the Simple IRA, and the Solo 401k. So I know we got a lot of self-employed individuals, whether you're an investor or realtor or CPA or an attorney, a lot of people will set these plans up for themselves. And a lot of people do it for the mere purpose of they wanna get tax deductions. I know a lot of people out there who are self-employed have a SEP IRA, for example. Now what their CPA tells them is, okay, you've made X amount of money, but you need to take, reduce some of this tax liability because you wanna pay less taxes today. I get it, that's what a CPA is paid to do, but they're looking at it, I would say, short term. They're saying, hey, here's how much taxes you can save this year. Well, if you're an investor, you might wanna think more long term. And the reason I say that is because with a SEP IRA, for all intents and purposes, it's just like a traditional IRA. It's actually defined as a traditional IRA, meaning it's pre-tax. Meaning you put money into a SEP IRA, you typically take a tax deduction. But the contributions are quite high. Now it is based on your income, but the SEP IRA, you can contribute uh, up to $55,000 now, but it is a, uh, it's a combination of your income. If you W-2 yourself, you can contribute up to 25% of your income, not to exceed 55,000. It's actually incorrect there, that full solo 401k information should be up top. But if you W-2 yourself as a business owner, you can contribute the lesser of 25% of your income or 55,000. If you're self-employed, if you're just 1099 uh, or, or Schedule C, it's roughly 20% of your earnings. But that's a pretty sizable amount if you're an investor and you're making a lot of money or you're self-employed and you're making a lot of money. So just think about this. If you're going to throw $50,000 into an IRA, would you rather grow it tax deferred or would you rather grow it tax free? I think a lot of people, if they're savvy, say, I can grow that 50 grand into 500 grand. So in that case, I would say it's better to pay the taxes on the 50 grand than to wait and pay it on the 500 grand. Mm -hmm. So what can you do? You can convert it. Now that, the, now that the rules allow us to convert any traditional type IRA, regardless of your income, what a lot of our savvy investors will do who love that Roth IRA, they'll just use the SEP IRA as a bucket to make an additional contribution of say $50,000, but they want that $50,000 in their Roth, so they just convert it into their Roth. We call it the Texas two-step. I'm, I'm sure we just made that up. I'm sure in Idaho they don't call it. I've never Texas. heard of the Texas two-step before. Yeah, well, yeah. First time. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you could use it, or you know, where are you at right now, Mayor? Are you New York? Here? The New, New York, York? two-step. Right. That's what they call it's like it. The New York two-step. <laughs> Do you want to take questions on the go, or you want to save them to the end? If you got questions, you can stop me, and I can answer them as on the go. Okay, I got a question here from Castle. Can you discuss the wisdom of having the beneficiary of it uh, of Roth IRA, Roth 401k, be a personal property trust? I can't talk about that because I'm not I'm not licensed to talk about that. I, I would say talk to a professional that handles that. Um, but to, to to answer that question somewhat is I, I do think there's a lot of benefit for certain situations to have your beneficiary as a trust. Uh, I know some of my family members have beneficiaries as a trust. It really just comes down to uh, personal preference and you would want to consult with a, you know, state attorney or somebody that actually handles that stuff. For us, it doesn't matter. You can leave it to a trust or you can leave it to a person. I was just wanted to make the, um, uh, the statement of RMDs. You want to understand that depending on if you are passing it to a person, you may want to pass it to a younger person, not an older person. Again, personal preference. Mm -hmm. Second part of that question was, uh, also, Roth 401ks are inheritable also, is that correct? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. They are. So all of the all of these accounts are inheritable. So you you actually have to have beneficiaries when you open any of these accounts. So they have to go, and it's very important to keep up with the beneficiaries too. So uh, because we don't change them, you have to request to change mm -hmm. them. So if something you know life changing happens in your life, divorce, someone dies, you always want to check back with us and make sure you change those beneficiaries, you'd be shocked how many uh, ex-wives or ex-husbands get somebody's IRA because they <laughs> you know, forgot to change the beneficiary to their new spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, very, very important to, to kind of map that out. Like you said, plan, plan. for the future and backtrack. Yeah. Right? Uh, we so, got another question from Castle. Which banks are compatible to use for a trust account for a 401k? As I've heard, many do not offer such accounts. That's actually a good point. So we actually run into that a lot because when we set up the solo 401ks, there's a lot of banks that I'm being politically, they just don't get it. They don't understand that the, if the 401k is going to have a bank account. It's kind of weird. Um, don't quote me on it, but we have a specialist, Rebecca Miller, who actually handles it. I want to say that Wells Fargo seems to be the, the one that we've found that is best to understand it, but it's not even all Wells Fargo. It's like somebody specific at Wells Fargo she's dealt with because if she's talked to other people at Wells Fargo, then they don't get it. But I totally understand where she's coming from. There are a lot of banks that just don't get it when we're trying to set it up. So um, I would say it's not necessarily the bank, but it's probably just the individuals that you're talking to that don't get it. Right. Sometimes the banker doesn't know what you're talking about and that's why that bank yeah. doesn't do it. It's not because the bank doesn't offer because I'm sure that I've worked in banking mm -hmm. and I didn't understand every product that we had on the checking side, especially with retirement accounts. Cause I wasn't educated in that. You don't yeah. learn that stuff until, uh, until you're a W2 employee. Then all of a sudden you have a 401k, 401k account. That's, you know, in some kind of dividend or some kind of, you know, mutual fund, but it's not something that the average person is aware of. That's why you got to go out and do your research and, and, uh, and get educated on it. Yeah, it's just like anything else. There's good dry cleaners, there's bad dry cleaners. There's, you know, <laughs> good CPAs, yeah. bad CPAs. It's just really a person. But if you wanna, if, uh, if that person, if you wanna call us, ask for Rebecca Miller. She's our 401k expert. She's been doing it for years and she's amazing. She could tell you all about it and she could tell you, uh, you know, who she, who she uses. And especially if you're setting it with, up with us, you know, we have ins and outs. We know who to go to and bypass all that problem. Okay, we got one more question and we'll get you going again. Uh, Sarah asks, um, can you explain how people with income above the limit for having an IRA can have any IRA account? Above, I'm not sure what limit, above the... Um, I guess there's some restrictions, right? With the Roth IRA, it's 5,500. With the SEP IRA, it's 55,000. Like, mm -hmm. I guess if you're over the limit, how, do you, how, how are you able to use each of those retirement accounts? I think that's what she's asking. Well, one of the things you want to think about is if you're talking about contribution limits, yes, you are limited. There's really no way around it. But the way you want to think about it is if I'm limited to the personal plans like traditional Roth, you're limited. You can only throw in 5,500 a year if you're under 50 or 6,500 a year if you're over 50. So how do you get around that? You can't get around it, but you can open other accounts that you can make contributions to. If you're self-employed, that's why you would want to open a SEP IRA because you can make additional contributions to that. And then I'll get to the final plan, which is your health savings account and education savings accounts. You really just want to find out how many accounts can I have. And if you're looking to shovel more money in, you might just have to dice it up into multiple accounts, not just, you know, one. You can't get around it. But I will say, don't get contributions confused with profit. Profits unlimited. So people always think, well, how do I make money if I, I, I can only put in 5,500? 5,500 is only what you take out of your pocket and add. I'm a believer that you might just want to put as little as possible in there. Let the investment grow the account. You keep your own money. Let the investment grow the account. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's great with people that like buy property subject to. If, if you know, they have a property that they, they uh, put up a small amount of money for, they might have to have a buffer in there for some repairs or, or some anticipated vacancy. But really, that it, a renter is paying the underlying mortgage and they're just sitting on it. Right? So you just sit on that investment. Every time a renter make, or a, a one of the renter makes a payment, it's like ching ching, the note value goes down. And you just sit on that investment. And then 20 years down the road, guess what? Your Roth IRA owns a house free and clear. Mm -hmm. so, and, and so you don't have to shovel money in there if you don't want. Um, I think you put as little money in there as possible and let the IRA do its stuff and, and grow tax-free. All right, we're gonna 
Sarah's followed up with the point. She, she explained the, uh, the question a little bit more. So it says, she wrote, you may only contribute to a Roth IRA if you make less than a certain amount of money, 135,000 for single filers, 199 for married couples. So I guess that's what she was talking about. How would you invest in that situation? So I'll expand on that. That's, that's going back to the Texas two step. So if I go back here, just to show you, with a traditional IRA, there is no income limit. You're not limited on, you can make a million dollars a year and still contribute $5,500 uh, into that account or 6,500 if you're above the age of 50. So since there's no income limit there and no income limit to convert, you just do it in two steps. You put it into the traditional IRA first as a contribution and then you convert it to your Roth. Or put it into your SEP IRA and do the same thing. SEP IRA, put it in there and convert it to your Roth. So there's, a, there's always a way. I mean, there's always a way. Well, I mean, there's a way now. They, they yeah. used to not be a way, and I, I'm pretty sure they're going to put that income limit back on because uh, I'll just be honest with you. The IRS does not like these Roth IRAs, especially <laughs> when you get, especially when you get these six-figure income earners that know how to know what to do with a bucket of money. Mm -hmm. You're seeing people grow massive Roth IRAs, and I guarantee you that the IRS they don't necessarily like it because they don't like when they can't get their hand in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, through, they always have, you know, when elections are going on, they always have these things that try to come out and try, they try to put these things on the, on the uh, ballot. Uh, there was a, I can't remember, there's a politician out of Oregon, I think, this past election year was trying to uh, add RMDs to the Roth IRA, put the income limit back on conversions and limit the amount you can earn in a Roth IRA. They wanted to put a cap on how much you can earn. That's so, crazy. <laughs> yeah, they don't like it. But what I always tell people is don't live in the doomsday scenario. What if use the rules as they are right now, mm -hmm. right now you could Texas two step money, regardless of how much money you make, throw it in the traditional, convert it to a Roth, grow that sucker, do as much as you can until they tell you no. So mm -hmm. take it. Yeah. Use what's there. Use what's available. These are the rules, right? Stick it to them while the rules are there. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, continue. So again, yes. these employer plans, the benefit to them is they allow for larger contributions than most of the other plans. You can see the contributions I threw up there. And the solo 401k is a great one. There is some dangers there because everybody always asks about the solo 401k. It is a very, very powerful uh, uh, thing to have, but it also comes with more responsibility. We do have solo 401ks. We actually require anybody that um, opens one to have a special consultation with our CEO and our 401k expert to make sure that they understand the rules, they understand the reporting, and they understand the, the due diligence on the client's end because it's not an account that we administer. We just sell the plan documents and help you get it set up. But once you set a solo 401k up for yourself, you are in control. You have the checkbook. You have to do the tax reporting. You have to do the bookkeeping. Some people are good with that. Some people aren't. Um, there are some qualifications to having one too. You have to be self-employed first. You also have to legitimize the 401k in the first year you set it up, meaning you have to make a first year's contribution based on earnings. So you have to show that you earned money as, as self, some self-employment income in order to legitimize the 401k and make a contribution. And unfortunately, rollovers or moving money into the account doesn't count as a contribution. They say, you got to report earnings and you got to take some money out of your pocket and make a contribution. If you can do that, and if you're okay with doing your own tax reporting, uh, and doing your own record keeping, it could be a great tool for a lot of investors because, again, you do get to write the checks, so you do get to make the investments a little bit quicker. Even though we're pretty quick on our end in processing the investments, it's always going to be quicker for you to just cut a check yourself. Uh, you do get large contributions that you can make into the account. It's the only account that, that we have that, again, you can make loans to yourself. So you can do it just like any other 401k. That's just a rule with 401ks that allow you to loan to yourself. Uh, $50,000 um, or, or half of the uh, balance, whatever's less. And there is an exemption for UDFI. I'm not, I don't have time to talk about UDFI, but it's a tax that you would have to pay if your investments are debt leveraged. We have a class on it. If you guys are interested, you can uh, email me and I'll, I'll give you a copy of that class. Um, but there's a specific exemption if you're buying debt leveraged real estate. If you're not, doesn't really matter. But again, there's a, again, like anything else, there's always pros and cons to it. This is not a magic washing machine that makes all your problems go away. You just have to make sure that you can deal with the advantages and disadvantages. But again, great account if you're looking to stash money away from Uncle Sam and have a little bit more control of it. And then these are the plans that I really like to talk about 
which are, we call this the dessert menu, right? Or would you like fries with that? But Coverdell Education Savings Account and, and Health Savings Accounts can also be self-directed. Coverdell, and these are accounts that the benefit can be used today. Coverdell Education Savings Accounts are for your children. You can set one up for any of your children, provided they're under the age of 18, if you haven't set one up for them before, because you can only make contributions to the plan up until their 18th birthday. And the contributions are relatively small, $2,000 per child per year. But again, if it's about getting the money in there and what do you do with it once it's in there. And I have a case study showing you how uh, two parents used their IRAs and then their uh, son's Coverdell education account to combo on one investment. And that's what you really wanna do. You wanna, how can I, how many of these accounts can I have? And I can put them all into one investment and they all get profit pro rata that all have tax benefits that I don't get as an individual. But the Coverdell is really cool. You make contributions into the Coverdell, you can self-direct the Coverdell to make investments. The benefit is when profit comes back to the Coverdell, it's not taxed, provided you use that money to pay for qualified education expenses for that child. And qualified education expenses are from pre-K all the way through college. It's not just a college savings plan, but it's anything from pre-K through college. So things like tuition, uh, some tutoring, uniforms if they're going to private school, books. Uh, I've seen people buy iPads with distributions from their child's Coverdell education account. And really what they're doing is they're just using a different bucket to save themselves in taxes. Instead of using their money to do an investment where they pay tax and they got to pay for education anyways, they're just doing the investment in a name where they get to save more money and consume more goods. Meaning if I have $10,000 of education expenses for my child and I need to go out there and make money to pay for those $10,000 of expenses, if I'm doing that as an individual, that doesn't mean I make $10,000 and then I'm good to go. That means I have to make seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars because then I got to pay taxes to get me to 10. Mm -hmm. So again, you get end up in that rat race trying to keep up with your expenses by using your money, which is the most expensive money because that's the money that's taxed. But you switch that mindset and you do an investment that you would have made $17,000 on but you make it $17,000 in the Coverdell, that's $17,000 you have to, to, to spend on education expenses. So you're just doing an investment in a different name to consume more goods and save money from, from Uncle Sam. Um, so again, Coverdell education accounts are great. We have classes on both of these plans. I really like the health savings account too because everybody has health expenses regardless of you know how much they jog or, or, or anything like that. It's always funny, I ask people, do you have health expenses? And they go, well, not really. Everybody has health expenses. If it's if anything that's out of pocket health expense that your insurance doesn't cover, that's a health expense. Whether it's you buying glasses, uh, prescriptions, holistic medicines, acupuncture, uh, going to the dentist, root canals, all that stuff's medical related. But if you're using your money to pay that stuff, again, you're going to be spinning your wheels trying to keep up with taxes and trying to pay those expenses. A health savings account is a savings account you can have in combination with your insurance. It allows you to put money into the health savings account. You can self-direct it and pick your own investments, but the profit can be distributed to pay for your out-of-pocket health expenses tax-free. And not only that, when you put money into the health savings account, you get a tax deduction. So it's the best of both worlds. It's actually even better than the Roth IRA, some people say. Because when you put money into it, you get a tax deduction on the contributions. And when you remove the money or, or remove the profit, it's tax-free and penalty-free for qualified health expenses. So you get both sides of it. Goes in tax-free comes out tax-free. The contributions are pretty small, but again, it's fully tax deductible. But here's the cool thing I like, is you can invest that money and keep it in there and actually reimburse yourself with the distribution to pay for prior year's expenses. It's the only account you could do that with too. So for instance, if I'm just making contributions to my health savings account and taking a deduction, I actually don't wanna to touch that money to pay for my out-of-pocket expenses. I just wanna use my money and save the receipts. Because what's Einstein say? The greatest force in the universe is compounding interest. So if you just leave the HSA as it is, it compounds on itself. And if you don't nickel and dime it, you have more capital that compounds on itself. And you can take a big fat distribution at any point in the future to reimburse yourself for prior year's expenses. And you can go back as far as you want, provided you've had the health savings account in place that whole time. So again, you can go back 10 years and reimburse yourself for prior year's expenses, provided you have the receipts. So it's like, it's flexible in how you use it. And uh, don't get it confused with a flexible spending account. If anybody has one of those out there, this is not a flexible spending account. It's not one of those, if you don't use the money, you lose it at the end of the year. I don't even know why they call that flexible. Uh, but this is, <laughs> this is a health savings account, which is completely different. You don't lose the money. You can reinvest it. 
um, and it's really cool in how it works. But again, once you start identifying how to use these plans, using the tax benefits that are allowed to you, you're sticking it to the government with their own rules. And as an investor, your back pocket starts to feel a lot heavier because you're paying less in taxes on your investments and you're getting to retirement faster. So that's the cool thing I like about these accounts. I'm going to talk about, you know, and all of these accounts can be invested into all sorts of things. These are some of the investments we see at Quest. Again, you know, we like to think of ourselves as the investment or the real estate experts, just because our principals are real estate investors. I'm a real estate, I was a real estate investor, our uh, CEO and our president are both real estate investors. It's our niche. You know, if you want to invest in gold and silver, I would say that's not our niche. Uh, there's other self-directed custodians that understand more of that. We understand real estate and more importantly, we actually understand notes. Notes is actually the largest holding that we have at Quest. A lot of people are shocked to hear that. We do a lot of this real estate education because people want to hear it. But mm -hmm. truthfully, most of our clients are note investors. They like to create notes or buy existing notes because it's more passive. A lot of times it's less work. Um, and if you're, if you're working a nine to five job and you want to self-direct, you don't have time to go find property on your own. But you might know a real estate investor that's good, finding good real estate investments and you can use your IRA like a bank. You just use your IRA like a hard money lender. and You can own a promissory note uh, in your IRA versus owning the property. You don't have to deal with toilets and tenants. And it's a paper asset, but it's secured by the house. So it's secured by collateral. I love doing that because it's no work on my end. And I, I like it because we call it mailbox money. We loan right. it to investors that we trust and we just see the money come in. And if it doesn't come in, well, then we might have to foreclose. But, you know, to this point, I've never had to do that. And I would never want to do that. I just want the real estate investor to knock it out of the park and me to get my healthy interest. And then on we go. And that's a pretty good relationship uh, to have. So notes is a great investment. But you can see there's all sorts of investment options available to you out there. But again, you're only limited to just no, no life insurance contracts, no collectibles. Anything else is fair game. Um, there are some restrictions. You just got to be careful. There are some rules with this. You can't self deal with your own IRA. Um, the investment restrictions are the two I named. The biggest restriction to understand is there's certain people your IRA can't invest with. The main person is yourself. You can't self deal your IRA back to you, meaning you can't give a loan from your IRA to you. You're the fiduciary of the account. That would be unfair to the IRA if you were allowed to negotiate deals to yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody can strike up a pretty fancy deal dealing with their cells, but then that, that, that would not be a benefit to the IRA. There would be no benefit to the IRA if you were directing it to buy your own investments. Um, so there's a list of disqualified people that also can't do those same types of investments. You can't self-deal your IRA to yourself, your spouse, uh, your lineal ascendants and descendants, which is just parents, grandparents, kids, grandkids, and they just disqualify those people because that's how wealth is passed. You usually pass wealth to the kids or to the spouses. So they say all of those people are fiduciaries to the plan because ultimately they're probably going to inherit this IRA and we don't want any self dealing with people that own it or are going to inherit it. So, and again, you don't have to be an expert in this. You can just always call us, whether you're a client or, a client or not, we'll kind of walk you through some of the education uh, to try to keep you out of trouble. But it is important, it is, uh, I think, important to understand at least the basis of these ideals before you start self-directing because this is one thing that can get you in trouble. Uh, Self-directed IRAs are not risk-free. Even though you have more control, you do have greater responsibility. Uh, you have more due diligence. And again, that's good for a lot of people, but it also can be dangerous for a lot of people too, because as our president likes to say, the best thing about a self-directed IRA is you get to pick the investments. The worst thing about a self-directed IRA is you get to pick the investments. Right. So just make sure you understand the rules and are picking good investments. And again, <clears throat> just, just, just another uh, uh, thing there. Um, now, even though you cannot uh, self-deal with your IRA, one thing that's important is that you can partner with your IRA, which is different. Self-dealing with your IRA is like this chart, right? You and your IRA are two separate people. If you have a house, you can't sell it to your IRA. If your IRA owns a house, you can't buy it from your IRA because you can't be on two, two sides of the fence like that. But if you're to put your IRA on the same side of the fence, that's just partnering. That's actually not something that's prohibited. So for instance, say I had $50,000 in my IRA and I had $50,000 personally, okay? As long as I'm not doing a deal with my, myself, let's say I'm doing a deal with me here, he's got a good investment, and I wanna make a $100,000 loan to him. Well, I can partner my IRA and me on that same note to Mahir, because Mahir's not disqualified to me. I just have to make sure I indicate those as two separate people on the note, which is really easy. You just have two lenders, and it's just a fractionalized note. Nate Hare owns you know, an undivided interest of 50% of this note, 
and uh, Quest IRA, FBO, and Nate Hare's IRA owns the other 50% of that note. And I just have to make sure that I keep that money separate and going into two different buckets because I can't co-mingle my funds with my IRA funds. But that's important to know because a lot of times you might have a smaller IRA and you might need to partner with your IRA in order right. to do some investments. Or you just want to make a little bit of money too uh, personally. And again, you might have a good investment so you combo yourself uh, and your IRA together or you just combo your IRAs together, meaning your IRA, your spouse's IRA, your kids' Coverdales, your HSA, your SEP IRA. Maybe those are all the accounts that you're going to involve, and they might all be listed on the note. But the benefit is, is when you get payments back or you get income back, all of those payments are going to be split pro rata. So now you got some money going to, uh, to your Roth IRAs. you got some uh, prop, uh, of the profit going to your SEP IRA, maybe. Some of the profit going to your education savings account, which you can use for the kids' ed education expenses right away. And you got some of the profit going to feed your health savings account, which, again, you can take it or leave it. Use it for health uh, expenses today or save it and let it ride uh, to the future. And that's a powerful thing when you start partnering these accounts together. And I'll show you a little case study on, on basically how uh, two clients did this. So we had a client, Robert and Linda, pretty basic, pretty traditional type investment, I would say. We see a lot of common, we call it a split asset. People are gonna use multiple accounts to buy one asset because they wanna get more tax uh, benefits. So what they did is they both had a rollover traditional IRAs that they had rolled over to Quest and then they converted them to Roth because they really liked the idea of growing this tax-free. So they used the uh, husband's account, Robert's Roth IRA and Linda's Roth IRA, but they also set up a, Roth, a covered education account for their nine-year-old son. And they put, two thousand, or they put a little bit of money in there. And what they did is they had this house that was literally right on their block, the block that they live on. Um, it was a house that was vacant. They, they, they found who the owner was, they negotiated a good deal, and they, fit, they figured they could just flip this house but they didn't want, need the money for themselves. They just wanted to kind of grow their retirement, but they also wanted it to a little bit of money to pay for uh, the nine-year-old's education expenses because they were putting them through private school. So what they did, they found this property and they decided we're gonna partner our accounts together and we're gonna uh, uh, hire a contractor to, to fix it up and then we're gonna flip it, okay? And basically here's how it worked out. They negotiated, I'm rounding the numbers just to make it easy. They negotiated a purchase price of $100,000. This is that down here in Houston. It's actually uh, near our office. Um, the repairs, again, when the IRAs own these uh, properties, the pay repairs are paid by out of the IRAs. So that's a, that's a function of our business that we do. We have a payment uh, authorization department. If you have contractors that need to be paid, you send us invoices and we, we uh, pay those out of the IRAs that are combined on this deal. So uh, just a rough estimate, they used the, both Roth IRAs and the ESA to send out $130,000 when it was all said and done, okay? $78,000 of it came from the husband's Roth. So 78,000 was 60% 60, 60 of this investment. Okay? It's important to keep these percentages uh, parallel throughout the whole thing. The wife's IRA was a little bit smaller. She had 35% of the deal. And then their Coverdale, they had make, been making contributions for a few years, uh, had, was a 5% owner of this investment. Again, they're not making di uh, uh, different investments. They're all comboed in the same investment. And then when they flipped it, all of the profit went back to the IRAs in those specific percentages. And all they did was when they drew up the contract, they just have three buyers on the contract and the buyers are listed as Quest IRA Inc. FBO is for the benefit of followed by the client's name and their account number, and then the Roth IRA for Linda and Quest IRA FBO Max Jones in this Coverdell account. This, account, this uh, investment worked pretty well. They flipped the house. They sold it for $189,900 four months later, giving them net proceeds of about, of about $180,000 after, after a closing cost. Total tax-free gain of fifty grand, and it was spliced up like this. Husband's Roth IRA in four months got thirty grand tax free. Wife's Roth IRA got seventeen five tax free. And then they had an additional twenty five uh, hundred go to Max's Coverdell Education account, which again could be used to, uh, immediately to pay for uh, some tuition or you know tutoring or all sorts of education expenses. So this is a perfect example of how you partner these different types of accounts together. And this is a real small deal and how you get multiple buckets moving. And again, none of this money will ever be taxed because they did it in a Roth, a Roth and a Coverdale, no taxes on any of the profit. I think that's how you get to retirement. That's how you pay for things faster. That's how you get out of that rat race uh, that we're all in trying to keep up with Uncle Sam. Um, here's one that I did just real quick. I, I know we're running out of time. How much time do I got here? Is it five minutes? Yeah, we'll wrap up in about five. 
Okay, so this is just a real, real quick one that I that I did just to show you. You don't need a lot of money in these accounts to get going. To a lot of people think, oh, do I need a hundred thousand dollars to to go do some of these deals? No, you, it's really I've seen investments as as low as ten dollars. I've seen people uh, do wholesale deals in the name of an IRA and use ten bucks. I've seen a hundred dollar. Uh, I saw a hundred dollar option uh, investment to, uh, fork back forty grand uh, in eight weeks. Uh, so again, people are just applying their well, knowledge. The Bitcoin. <laughs> What's that? So what was he in Bitcoin? <laughs> no, no, it's a real estate option. All he did wow. was put up a consideration to have the first right to buy uh, to buy a property. So he had the option to buy it, and then he just assigned the option to another investor. That's yeah, nice I had deal. another. Yeah, another client, and again, I wish I had time time to talk about this. A good friend of mine here in Houston, his first deal, he did a real estate option of ten thousand dollars on a property uh, in a rough area of Houston, the Third Ward, which mm -hmm. has actually been really revitalized lately. Uh, but he used ten thousand dollars to to give to a, a lady that had basically she had not paid her property taxes and was getting foreclosed on. So mm -hmm. she basically had no options. She had no family. She had nowhere to go. The house was a hoarder house. It was only worth maybe thirty grand. But then he was going to have to demo it, and he didn't want to buy it basically. But he said, "I'll give you ten grand. Five grand we'll, we'll use to pay the." the past due taxes so you're not kicked out and then I'll let you keep five grand but he but I didn't he didn't know what he wanted to do with the house because it was hoarder house he just one of the uh, um, risks of doing a real estate option is you might just lose that consideration if you walk away from the deal mm -hmm. but you do have the first right to buy if you decide to exercise your rights to buy it so they negotiated that the purchase price would be ten thousand dollars the ten thousand he gave her but he, she would have an option of two years. So the option period was two years. He had two years to decide whether or not he wanted to buy it. Mm -hmm. And he, the reason he did it for two years is he allowed the lady to live in the house rent free for two years. So it solved her problem. She got to stay in the house, not get foreclosed on, and she got a little money in her pocket. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, okay, two years, I'll let you live rent free, but you got to find somewhere to go, you know, find some family or something at that point. Well, right. long story short, two years comes in, she finds some family to move up with up north. And the thing with the, with the uh, area is that that land actually appreciated uh, significantly. Because uh, in the third ward, Houston's weird, there's no zoning. So you can have like a $30,000 hoarder house next to a $700,000 multifamily building. Uh, so anyways, long story short, he ended up being able to sell that, uh, just the land alone for $325,000. So wow. Roth, and he did it in his Roth IRA. He didn't do it personally because he would have paid taxes on it. Oh, yeah. but basically, he took a $10,000 Roth IRA investment and added $297,000, all tax-free to the Roth. So that's, that's what he does. the Roth. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. So again, he eliminated taxes from his life by just doing it in that, in that account. And again, he only used $10,000. Uh, this is one that, um, you know, I just, there was an investor that needed a small loan to do a rehab. This was, again, another kind of hoarder house. It was a $25,000 purchase, $30,000 rehab. Um, at the time, I had my money out on other deals. So I didn't want to pass up on this deal, though, because it was a really good deal, because the ARV on this house was one hundred and twenty grand. So I figured as a lender, that's a good one for me to be secured on because mm -hmm. I'm not worried about this guy not paying me because there's a lot of built-in equity there. But again, I don't want the house really. I just want the payments. So we nego we started talking, we started negotiating. And since it was such a good deal and he needed the money fast, he didn't have time to get bank financing. And there's not a lot of banks that would finance this house anyways. It was pretty rough shape. Mm -hmm. um, we negotiated that he was okay paying 12% and two points up front. So what I did is I didn't want to pass up on this deal. Right. So what I did is I just actually got eight total IRAs together. Only one IRA was mine. I went and got, you know, some of my friends, coworkers and things like that, that wanted to get in on a deal. And we pulled, I pulled seven different other, other people's IRAs. I partnered their IRAs with my IRA, negotiated. The, the, uh, I basically did all the negotiation. But what I did that was interesting when I put this up there is that first I asked all the other investors if they were okay with my Roth IRA putting only 550 bucks in or 1% of the loan amount. I just made it an even 1%, but retaining the two points up front. Since I was putting the deal together, I said, can my Roth IRA retain the two points and then we'll all split the 12%. They were fine with it because their money wasn't invested before. So they were making 0%. So are they going to shy away at 12%? No. So what happened is, is in the note, in the instructions, my Roth IRA actually retained two points up front, but it retained it on $55,000, not just my, 550. So basically when we closed on this deal, I, I just put a measly 550 bucks in the deal. I raised the other money through other people's IRAs 
and got 1100 bucks back to my IRA at closing because I got the points up front. Mm -hmm. And then everybody netted 12% throughout the year because the, the investor paid us and paid us off on time and paid us off in one year. So again, it's not about how much money you have in an IRA. It's really just about how creative you can get, how do you pool more money together, and just how do you use your knowledge to, uh, to invest it into something that you're knowledgeable about. So um, as I wrap up, I always remind people, the more you understand about these IRAs, the more you can talk to other people about, you know, using their IRA money to maybe fund some of your own deals. And like I said, most of the people out there do not want to find their own property. They want to give people the, the money and, and you make them profit. If you're an investor looking to raise private capital, IRAs are one of the biggest sources of capital out there. Uh, there's $27 trillion sitting in retirement accounts right now. It's the largest source of America's wealth. Only 2% of it is self-directed. So there's a huge opportunity out there for, for investors to go out and raise private capital if they have the ability to network. I know there's a lot of good networking going on at your event. Um, here. There's a lot of good note investors. And I think you talk a lot about, you know, raising private money and, and doing it through IRAs. So, I mean, you, you're practicing what we preach. I mean, it's, it's great. I see investors all the time raising money. And, and, and the thing that I like about it is you guys are not just making money for yourself. You're making money for your investors. If you're raising private money from pe people's IRAs, you're not only making a life-changing event for yourself, you're making a life-changing event for them. If yep. you could take somebody who's got a retirement sitting in a CD making 1%, and then you put that money into a, a secured real estate deal and you pay them 8% as a borrower, that's a life-changing event to that person. You mm -hmm. might be able to allow people to retire earlier based on your knowledge. And it allows you to go buy as much investments or as much real estate as you want with no income, no, I mean, without putting up your income, without putting up your credit and borrowing money from a bank because it's all, it's, it's private money, it's a negotiation. And if you can build a, a, a network of IRA lenders, I tell you, there's a lot out there. Uh, you can buy as much real estate as you want with none of your own money. And even at Quest, we have about 300 million sitting undirected that people just are waiting to, to put out there in the market. So I can't give you the list though, uh, but if you, you know. How much you got to pay for that list? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not enough money, man. I'm not going no, to no. that. So, uh, but again, everywhere you go, if you, you, it doesn't matter if you're in Texas, New York, everywhere you go, there's people with IRA money and you just got to open up that dialogue and ask them, what's your retirement doing? Where's it at? You know, do, do you think you'd want to invest in, in real estate? I can show you how to do it and I can give you above average return. Uh, watch our private money lending class online. It's, it's a great class if you want to start uh, understanding how to uh, kind of talk that lingo and, and go find some of your own private money uh, through IRA money. So mm -hmm. it's out there, man. So um, just a reminder, Quest, we're a premier self-directed IRA company. Uh, we hold non-traditional assets. So we're just a company that holds uh, things like real estate or other tangible assets in retirement accounts versus stocks and bonds. We have a lot of free education. If people want to go to our website, questira.com, there's a ton of videos up there. We do a lot of different uh, variations of classes. So I encourage you guys to go visit that and, and take a look. And we have fast and friendly service with no expedited fees. We're not the cheapest out there, but we're by far not the most expensive. But I think we do add a lot of value with our knowledge and our experience and our speed. We fund investments faster than anybody out there. So, uh, you know, I, I encourage you guys to reach out to us if you're interested in learning more or setting up your own self-directed IRAs. Um, I know we do have a, a, a promo going on right now uh, through J July, up until July. So anybody that opens uh, an account will basically can open as many accounts as you want for just a hundred bucks. Typically it's a hundred bucks per account, but okay. we're doing it to where if, yeah, if, if you want to open as, you know, ESAs, Roth IRAs, you can do as many as you want. We're going to just charge you one application cost up front to open all of that. And not only that, each account you open, we're putting up names in a, in a drawing. And at the at, in July, we're going to pick one lucky person that actually gets an, a, a, a trip on Quest, basically. $2,000 towards the trip of your choice to a Quest event. So we have a Dallas Expo coming up. That's a huge expo in August. Mm -hmm. We'll fly you out. We'll set you up in a hotel, up to $2,000. Or we do um, an IRA fun cruise uh, a couple times a year. And we have one coming up, I think, next May that goes to Cuba. So if you want to network with uh, more IRA investors, uh, we'll pay for you to be on that trip if you if you win that. So again, any account that you open, the more accounts you open, the better. And again, we have a promo that allows you to open as many as you want for just a hundred bucks. Awesome. So let's let's take these last two questions, and then I want you to talk to everyone about your expo coming up because it is it is a very interesting event. Um, I personally, I don't know of a, of a self director or an IRA company that's putting together some kind of that an expo like what you guys are doing. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. But let's take yeah. these two questions first. 
So one question is from Castle regarding a disqualified person. Which basic requirements are understood regarding the fiduciary disqualification? Does that apply only to fiduciary of a 401k IRA or any fiduciary? Well, it, it, it's really any fiduciary. So there's a pretty black and white list that says these people are fiduciaries. And those are kind of the ones I mentioned. You are the fiduciary. Your spouse is a fiduciary. Lineal ascendants and descendants, whether they inherit the IRA or not, they're all fiduciaries and their spouses are fiduciaries. But other people can be fiduciaries, and it's really just about interpretation. It's not in the code, but it says anybody who's a fiduciary to the plan. So I'll give you an example. Uh, family to the side are not on the disqualified persons list. So brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, they're not on the black and white disqualified persons list. However, I'm not married, so my beneficiary of my IRAs right now is my brother right? Because he's got two nieces. I'd rather it go to him, right? And then when I get married, I'll change that. But right now, my brother is my beneficiary of my IRAs. That makes him a fiduciary now because he's, a, because he's the beneficiary of it. If he was an investor, I wouldn't be able to invest my IRA to him because he's listed as the beneficiary. Sometimes you can, depending on the control somebody has, if you're, uh, say, a power of attorney of the account, you could be viewed as a, as a beneficiary, meaning if you have decision rate, uh, making ability uh, to the IRA because you make the investment decisions, even though it's not your IRA, you're also a, you know, could be viewed as a fiduciary. So really it's just anybody who's too closely related to the IRA or might be inheriting the IRA that's a, that has that fiduciary responsibility and is considered a disqualified person. Okay, and Castle gives an example. If a friend is a trustee of a land trust that holds my personal residence, could my 401k or IRA lend money to him on a real estate deal or joint venture? Again, you, you, what I would just suggest is to consult with an attorney. It's, it's hard to say because it's, again, it's interpretation. Um, it has to be, a, he, if he's considered a disqualified person, or here's the other thing is, if, if you have two people that are closely related, let's say they're business partners, this might be something that he might want to look at. Uh, if, I, if I understood the, the scenario right. But say you have business partners um, and they, oh, I get this question a lot. Can I loan my IRA money to my business partner? Okay, even though my business partner might not be a disqualified person, okay? he's not related to me. Mm -hmm. There's something else that can make an investment prohibited, which is the investment your IRA makes provides you some sort of benefit personally. You, the, the disqualified person, provides you a benefit directly or indirectly. So a lot of times you gotta ask the question, well, is my IRA doing an investment to my business partner going to indirectly benefit me somehow? Because the IRS just doesn't like that. The IRS doesn't like your IRA to do investments that puts money right back in your back pocket. Again, that who we're not the police, so we're not gonna uh, make that determination. But I do think it's important to at least, you know, seek an attorney's advice and, and get a real opinion on it. Because again, I can't get tax legal or investment advice, but I would say if somebody is closely related to your IRA, you may want to just make sure that they're not considered disqualified uh, to you. Okay. Then we have a question here from Teresa. Uh, what if I'm buying a flip? Both my IRA has about 30% of the funds needed. Can I partner with my Roth in the flip? You can. So, and, and that's a good question that, that I want, want to address because what you, what you want to do is if you're going to partner with your IRA, you always got to remember that it has to be a completely parallel transaction from start to finish. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you analyze this from the beginning now or, or, or from the end and back up to it. But if you do it from the beginning, you, whatever percentages you start with, and it doesn't have to be 50-50, but let's say that I'm gonna buy a $100,000 house, I put up $70,000 from my IRA, and I put in personally $30,000. Well, now I have to stick to those percentages. 70% is owned by my IRA, 30% owned by me. So when I pay expenses, if I have to pay contractors, 70% of it has to come from my IRA, 30% comes from me. So 10 grand to a contractor, seven grand comes from my IRA, I gotta pony up the other three grand. And then when there's profit that comes back, it has to go back that same way, 70%, 30%. As soon as you start trying to move money to other buckets, the IRS is going to say it's not, it's not parallel. You're not partnering. you got to keep it parallel. Um, and what you want to not do is if you use your IRA, I've seen this happen before or, or not happen, but people have this question. They say use their IRA to make an investment. They buy a house. They intend to flip it. They, they, don't, they don't analyze the rehab right. 
So they go over the rehab budget and then they're illiquid in the IRA. They don't have enough money in the IRA to finish it. They ask, well, can I put my personal money in? Unfortunately, you can't because net, you're, it's not a parallel transaction. You can't have the IRA buy the house and then you do the rehab with your personal money. It has to be partnered from the beginning. You could make a contribution to the IRA if you haven't done that, and then we can use that to pay for more of the repairs. But it would be prohibited for you to extend that service to finish the repairs with your money if your IRA owns the property. That would be a form of, say, self-dealing. So like, let's say you're 50-50, right? Uh, I use my business and I use my IRA to buy this property. Mm -hmm. um, when you're funding the expenses, you're paying the contract, you may be paying a hard money loan, taxes, whatever. It doesn't have to go out evenly, but it has to even out at the end. So let's say overall your expenses are 23000 but uh, maybe I have the IRA account paying the taxes, the mortgage, and the water, and the utilities, right? But I have my business paying the contractor. Would that how does that kind of work? I mean, if you're going textbook rules, I would say that's not parallel, right? Okay. Would the IRS see that? Probably not, but I would, based on their rules, everything has to be split. Now, what I think people should do, and again, not giving investment advice, if you're gonna partner on an investment that there's gonna be rehab or there's gonna be a lot of money that needs to go out and come in, it might be better to set up an entity that does that. For instance, I'll do tr a trust. Trusts work well for me in Texas. Again, seek your professionals. Trusts are, are different in other states. But for me, for instance, if I'm going to do a deal partnered with a bunch of other accounts or even part, part with my personal money, I'll just set up a trust and I'll invest all the money into the trust first. Then I'll have the trust buy the house. Mm -hmm. That way, all the money is just going in and out of one entity. I don't have to worry about this, this split. And I'll just have a trustee of the trust that just cuts checks. It's just easier bookkeeping to do it that way. You mm -hmm. can use an LLC if you want, but in, I mean, for me in, in Texas, trusts are easier to set up and just break it down after the investment's done. But if you're partnering a lot of different accounts together and you're worried about, you know, getting money from Quest and putting up your personal money, just, I would say, think about investing it into an entity first and let the entity take title to the investment. Gotcha. So Nate, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Quest Expo, a couple months out. Uh, I'm sure you still have a couple of tickets on sale. Uh, tell us who's going to be there. What, what's the format like? What could they expect? Well, there's going to be a lot of people there. So, and again, I, as far as we know, it's the first uh, IRA Expo in Texas. Um, I think there's other companies that have done it, uh, but we're doing it and we're pulling out all the stops. This is going to be our biggest event that we've ever done. Uh, it's going to be a two-day event uh, in August. I think it's August 25th, 26th. I don't have my thing here, but go to our website. You'll see it right on there, uh, mm -hmm. but it's at the end of August. Um, we have a star-studded uh, lineup of speakers, uh, you know, everybody from, you know, Scott Carson, uh, Eddie Speed, Brad Sumra, you know, Phil and uh, Chanel Grove. There's all sorts of uh, speakers and you get to hear all of the speakers because it's, it's different. We don't have breakout rooms at this expo. We just have one big massive room and we have two days of speakers lined up. Um, tickets are on sale for that. We're expecting, I would say, close to a thousand people, anywhere from 500 to a thousand people. We have um, 36 vendors all from all over the country. And these are vendors that are highly vetted by us. We don't just let anybody come in and sell their stuff. Uh, but we have a lot of guys that um, are going to be there that provide good, you know, services, you know, auction.com. Um, you know, there's a lot of different other vendors. There's, I, I know one uh, guy's coming, he's going to film his, um, his podcast there. So he's going to be doing some stuff. So if you want to get some airtime with them, uh, it's just going to be a really fun event. You can buy general admission tickets that get you obviously access to, to all the speeches and, and the vendors and all that. But then you can also buy, uh, we have VIP passes, uh, if you want to buy VIP passes, you get some special access. We have kind of a VIP breakout room that we're going to set up, which um, will be for anyone that buys the VIP tickets and the speakers. So if you want to network with the speakers themselves, and we'll provide like food in there and those types of things. It, so it's kind of a, you know, plush thing. It's almost like a VIP room, I guess you yeah. would say. Um, but it's going to be really cool. We're so excited for it. Uh, again, so you can buy tickets online. And um, yeah, I hope I see everybody there. Awesome. Awesome. Nate, well, I appreciate you jumping on here. Um, great stuff. Uh, good luck at the event. I'm not going to be able to make it just because of a scheduling conflict, but I'm rooting for you. I hope you hit that thousand. Yeah. Well, hopefully I see you at one of your events too. I mean, it was a great event. I mean, if nobody's, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people on here have been there, but that was a great event. 
real hot, real high uh, uh, talent people. You know, I like that high education stuff. It's, it gets boring going talking to the newbies sometimes. A lot, a lot of times, I like going to events like yours where you talk to some more advanced. <laughs> awesome. All right, Nate. Have a good day. Have a good night. Uh, replay will be up in a couple of days, everybody. Uh, Nate, uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Catch up on a couple of things. Yes, appreciate it.